this morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. What a blessing to worship Nashville First Church this morning on a gorgeous Sabbath day. And share with you, uh, I was here a couple of months ago with our choir. Uh, if you remember, some of you may have been here to hear the gorgeous voices that um, have since been uh, worshiping in a number of places, um, at least once a month on Sabbath at one of our churches, um, sharing the gospel. And as Zarita just mentioned, um, having um, spent a little bit of time in Costa Rica, and I will tell you a little bit about that because um, as a principal, I am uh, incredibly um, proud. And actually one of the, the adults that was on the trip said, if I was any more proud of the students that are on this trip, it would be a sin. And um, I will tell you that during the 10-day uh, trip, um, including travel, those students performed 22 times to more than 4,000 people. And they traveled uh, about 1,000 miles on a bus um, around the, the capital city of San Jose and the surrounding areas. And they preached, or they, um, they sang, they witnessed through music, both in English and Spanish, um, in, the, um, in a church plant, in private and public schools, in uh, churches, Adventist and non-Adventist, in cathedrals, in, um, at a soccer camp um, for teenagers that is funded by ADRA and the U.S. Embassy and uh, at a host of different places, including, get this, the bus driver's brother-in-law's funeral service. Um, it's a little different in Costa Rica. Um, they um, actually have their funeral services immediately. And uh, so uh, Rodrigo uh, came to pick us up in the morning, and he looked a little down, and we were wondering kind of what was going on. Well, his brother-in-law had passed away early that morning, and I'm uh, trying to figure out how to get all the, be a good family member and be supportive of the situation. And yet he's got to drive these kids around and what are we going to do? And in the course of um, resolving all of that, at five o'clock that afternoon, we drove right up to the, to the church, hopped off the bus, and my students went in and sang two songs in Spanish, including the Lord's Prayer, for the funeral service. And uh, the choir and uh, the church choir and the church pianist didn't show up. So our piano player, our director actually played piano for the service, and, and our kids were able to witness to 350 other people that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise do. Um, and then they went to the, to the um, um, cemetery and sat quietly while Rodrigo um, went to the graveside to have a service, as I have been with a lot of students um, over the 20 years of education. But to see a group of students be that incredibly respectful when they would really rather be running and jumping and shopping and doing whatever else teenagers would love to do and for them to be that respectful in, in that moment um, speaks volumes of the character of my kids. And I say mine, I guess I can claim them after eight months. I really have had nothing to do with their upbringing because um, I've only been here a short time, but I praise God for, um, for the school and what, what it's doing in the lives of our, in the lives of our kids. Um, a tremendous blessing. Uh, I am here to share with you my passion for Adventist education, and you already got a little bit of a bio. I did grow up, I um, was born right there at Madison Hospital, and I grew up on the street, um, on the uh, sanitarium uh, drive right there, Faculty Row, and, uh, and then down Neely's Bend. And uh, this community has been my home. In fact, I, as a um, band and uh, play the clarinet and as a choir member, I remember singing on this um, platform and sharing um, with this church uh, when I was a kid. And it's pretty special to be back and, and serving in the place where I met Jesus and, and the place where um, I decided to give my life to what I believe is one of the church's most significant and valuable ministries and that is Adventist education. And uh, so I just wanna share with you um, today my passion and my reasoning for that, and that's what I wanna do today. But first I wanna pray with you if you'd bow your heads with me. Father God, we just wanna thank you so much for the privilege of Sabbath and for the blessing to come away from the craziness of our lives that keep us so busy. Um, and then we just have this day to dedicate to you and to our relationship with you. And Father, we pray for that. Um, right now, um, we pray for the desire in our hearts to be better children. 
And, um, and we thank you um, for the privilege of these next few moments and for Adventist education and for um, uh, the, the students that we're able to affect and the families and the, the, um, the individuals outside these circles that are blessed because of our kids. And, uh, and Father, we just pray for our time today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. I'm going to learn very quickly how to use this projector and make sure that I, um, I'm, I'm supposed to point this at a particular spot, I'm guessing. No? Oh, I might need to turn it on. On the side. Now it's on. There it goes. All right. Uh, one um, one day on our trip across the country, I told you that we just moved here, and so on our our trip across um, the country from California, moving to Nashville this summer through the heat of the desert, um, we were able to stop in and see several different families along the way and spend a night and visit with old friends from hither, thither, and yon. And uh, one of our trips was, or one of our stops was in Texas where two of my former students um, are living and raising their family. And one of the, the, the spouse, the female in the, um, in the, in the family, um, came to our school, my old school, in her junior year um, from public school. And uh, there had been um, some meetings at the, at the local public school and the youth pastor was working with these kids and she started um, trickling in and doing a few things with the youth group at church and then um, decided to come as a junior to the academy. And what's interesting now as an adult to have this conversation with this young mother who was telling me about her experience in my school for a two-year window having come in and she had no idea about the stories of the Bible that I grew up learning. She didn't know about David and Goliath. She didn't know about Little Maid and Captain Naaman. She had never heard of Daniel and the lion's den. She was raised without these stories in her home. She didn't know about Samuel, the little priest, or the, t- the stories that helped shape and mold my life. She wasn't familiar with the friendship story about David and Jonathan, you remember that one? Or the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it was so fun to unpack that a little bit with this now new mother who heard these stories and in, in her junior and senior year at the academy and now is ferocious about making sure that her children know these stories. Um, the, uh, the beautiful stories, you remember these books of my Bible friends that are very, very popular in my house right now. I have a five-year-old and, um, and these are very great, great stories uh, from the Bible. Mrs. White writes in Testimonies 8 that a great storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? She writes, we need not say the perils of the last day are soon to come. Already they have come, and we need now the sword of the Lord. It's from uh, Testimonies 8. One of my favorite stories out of these books and in my house right now because of my little one, Michaela loves the story of the great storm. And there's the the pictures of Jesus preaching, and um, then then he, he waves as the boat leaves the shore, and then he goes to sleep in the back of the boat, And suddenly, you remember this story? And suddenly there's a fierce wind. And you turn the page of these books and you can almost um, feel the rain. The the clouds are dark and there's really angry looking waves. And it's very descriptive. I can't wait to meet the artists from these books when we get to heaven and unpack this, uh, how they just got into the the scripture and, and built these beautiful pictures that are in there. But if you open your Bibles to Mark 4, Mark 4, Mark 4, verse 35, tells the story. Are you with me? Mark 4. And that day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with them. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him and they said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, I've got to back up and say, every time I read this, I get a little snicker. Because Mark, for some reason, thought it was important to say that little uh, prepositional phrase, on a cushion. Jesus was asleep on a cushion. Now, I'm not sure why that mattered, but as an English teacher, I think that's hilarious. Like, that was an important detail to put in. He's not just asleep in the back of the boat. He's on a cushion. And we're drowning. And I can just see Mark being very perturbed at this event. He's asleep on a cushion. And they wake him. Don't you care if we're going to drown? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and he said, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. You turn the page of these books and um, the author writes it this way. The wind stopped blowing. The waves were still. The clouds went away. The stars twinkled again. And the boat sailed on a sparkling path that the moon made on the water, and he crossed to the other side of the lake. My little five-year-old can repeat that. She can't read yet, but she knows them by heart. Some of us know what storms are like. You've been through them. Calm turned absolutely chaotic, and through the blessing of the Holy Spirit and God's leadership and the lives of his people, a fierce life storm suddenly becomes peaceful again. Praise God. Almost at the whisper of his name, the path gets smoother and you can see the moon sparkle on the path. But others of us know it's not always that way. See, sometimes he calms the storm with a whisper, peace, be still. He can settle any sea, but it doesn't mean he will. See, sometimes he holds us close and he lets the wind and waves go wild. Sometimes he calms the storm. Other times, he calms his child. There were 30 of us in my eighth grade class. Mr. Waterhouse was an academically solid, full of fun and energy, great teacher. But in the 10 months that we were there, the... um, historical fact, the Space Shuttle Challenger incident happened. That will date me, and now you will know I was in eighth grade when the Space Shuttle Challenger um, incident happened on the, on the path. Remember, there was a teacher on that flight. Um, also, during that school year, we lost a sister of a classmate to a tragic car accident. We lost two mothers to the same horrible, horrible disease, and we lost a classmate who'd been with us and a friend for more than seven years. Anybody want to be the eighth grade teacher that year? Anybody want to explain to a bunch of preteens how God is love when around us, not to mention the normal chaotic things that happen to preteens and junior high, and now we're losing the people we love. Anybody want to do that? See, sometimes he calms the storm. With a whisper, peace, be still, he can settle any sea, but it doesn't mean he will. I remember the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and about that fiery furnace. See, he could have saved him from the furnace. He could have made that whole situation change, but he didn't. They ended up in the furnace, and he was there with them. Sometimes he holds us close, and he lets the wind and waves go wild. Sometimes he calms the storm. Other times, he calms his child. And I want to suggest today that he calms the storm with the simple fact that the anchor is going to hold. Today I want to talk about anchors, that noun, that um, device that's hooked to a chain that drags on the bottom and attaches, uh, preventing or restricting motion of a vessel, or I want to talk about the verb to anchor, to secure, to fasten, to attach. And I'd like to ask a couple of questions today of you. To what are we attaching our children or ourselves? To whom are we anchoring? What are the things or the people or the events that will fasten or attach? or secure ourselves and our children to Jesus. And because I can guarantee that a storm is coming, I want to ask about that anchor. 
and because I believe that the storm is already present, I wanna ask for you to think about the anchor. So anchor number one today. Anchor number one for me is academics. Not in any specific order as you will see, but I do believe that an anchor is important. I believe that uh, in Proverbs we learn that for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul and that that is important. We must provide an academic anchor for children and to miss to miss that would be missing the mark. Adventist education began in 1853, maybe you know this, with five families in Bucksbridge, New York. And by 1900, there were 220 elementary schools across America. And their aim, like every other parochial school that was sprouting up at the time, was to provide specific religious instruction infused in the curriculum. And while that is still our goal today, specific religious instruction infused in the curriculum, still our goal today, it must be understood that a solid college preparatory, rigorous curriculum is necessary, it's mandatory. We must provide both a spiritual culture and an academic climate, and to fail that would be missing the mark. That being said, I wanna look with you with some statistics, and I know we were having some um, glitches um, in PowerPoint because your staff is amazing back there. We may have cured that. Um, I wanna look um, the, uh, at some information, just some statistics about the likelihood of a college degree. 14% of public school graduates will get a college, um, a four-year college degree, 34 from Catholic schools, but 87, yes, friends, 87% of Adventist Academy graduates will go on to get a four-year college degree. And private school students from low socioeconomic backgrounds are three times more likely than comparable public school students to get a bachelor's degree in their mid-20s. It's important, it's important. Nearly 100% of Seventh-day Adventist school employees are fully certified teaching faculty, and yet in some schools in the nation, in some states in our nation, it's as low as 58%. That should bother us a little bit. Adventist schools um, use the Iowa assessment, um, which is the, the largest, most widely used scoring um, student assessment. And our scores in the Iowa assessment are rivaled only by elite private schools that charge twice the tuition. And they select their students. And we don't. Now there are a couple of studies I wanna talk with you about today. Um, cognitive genesis, which some of you may have heard about before. It's a massive study, a longitudinal study that was done in Adventist academies, um, K-12s across the country. And uh, you can just see the, uh, the volume of data that they collected. And uh, we assessed the students from their test scores and we asked the students a series of questions. We asked parents questions, teachers questions, administrators uh, questions about the school. And the purpose of the study was just to get an idea about how successful we are at accomplishing our goal. I mean, if we're not doing what we think we're doing, then we ought to fix some things. And if we are doing, um, what do we contribute that to? What should we do more of because we're feeling good about these questions? And um, the results are very clear. Um, that we are above average in all subjects at all grade levels. This is K-12. And we are, more importantly, above the predicted. So our students are doing better academically than the test says they should be doing. Okay. And it's also interesting that the, it's the school size doesn't matter. So um, it can be a, a tiny one-room schoolhouse, which we have those in Kentucky 10, or it can be a large academy um, over where I am, if you count that large. Um, the other important data was that the longer you're in Adventist schools, the higher your achievement, and the higher your ability, but the higher your achievement, the longer you're in. Come in, stay in. Uh, I just wanted to t show you some local data. This is Madison Academy versus the state of Tennessee. ACT right there. Yeah. We have to anchor our children in a strong academic program. Now that's not it, but that is important. Academics is important. Anchor number two, community. 
I believe that God created us to live in community. He created man in his own image. What great love the Father lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And I believe that he called us to live in community, and I was blessed to grow up in a community. Did you know that 95% of brain development is done by the time you're three years old? Pretty amazing. And the worldview of a child is formed by the time they're 11, 12. Pretty important. Your home and that elementary school is pretty important. The worldview is formed by the time they're 11. That's why it's so important to study with those children and make sure that they know the lessons of the Bible and that they're committing those stories and those texts to memory before they're 11. Their worldview is formed. We've got to provide a social environment where people are making similar life choices during those formative years. We've got to anchor our children in a lifestyle choices. Now, I told you I was going to share with you two studies. The other study is value genesis, which is actually the one previous to cognitive genesis. It's done over um, multiple years. In 1990, actually, I was one of the first classes to take that test, or it's not a test, of the assessment. In 1990 and 2000 and 2010, and it was the churches, um, the Adventist church, this is the, and by the way, I should say that other denominations are very... Um, interested in the fact that we have these mass assessments. There is no school system out there that has a cognitive genesis. Um, It's pretty amazing that a church entity would get together and collect that much data on our kids. And the value genesis, the same way, it's a little older, but it's been done now three times, 1990, 2000, and again in 2010. And it's uh, to assess faith and values. Are we as a church, are we as a school system, are we raising the children what we think we're raising? Are we doing what we think we ought to be doing? And if not, what are we going to do about it? And there were some, several sections on the surveys that talked about at-risk behaviors. And uh, this one will give you a little bit of, of data on our at-risk behaviors. It shows um, three groups of Adventist um, school data and the general public school data. And um, you'll notice that we're losing ground in two of the three areas that I chose to list. Not all of them, but the ones I chose to list because I think they're important. Um, the difference is the, the um, Adventist school and the public school still still pretty significant. And this next graph will show you um, about communication. We think communication is very important. Um, and it breaks the results down into um, four grade levels, two conversations, Conversations with parents, conversations with teachers. Um, You'll just notice we want the yellow and the orange to be high and the blue to be low. Um, We want our kids talking to us. Are they talking to us? Are we giving them an opportunity to talk to us? One of the things that we did this year at Madison Academy was have something we're calling TSL. And maybe you've seen some of that advertised. Teenagers as a second language. And it is our attempt to give parents an opportunity to understand their teenager and give them permission to have some of the conversations they need to be having with their teenager. So we've covered, um, in the last three months, we've covered um, teenage depression. And uh, I will argue with you, the longer, the more we live inside our cell phones, the more depression we're going to get. um, Because they're communicating with the device and not with the person sitting right next to them. And then we tackled eating disorders, which by the way is also Um, uh, just something we struggle with because of uh, media, uh, self-image. And and then we uh, we tackled sexuality. And uh, in April, um, we're going to take a look at social media specifically and uh, unpack a little bit about that. We just want to give parents the opportunity to, like, let's talk about what's going on with our kids. Let's, um, this is our, our special treasure that's God given, that God's given us. Let's talk about it. What are we going to do? And uh, we believe that that's important. And if it's affecting our kids, it's, it better be affecting us. Um, this next one um, just shows a little bit about um, data we think is important, their opinions about their Adventist Academy. And they, they like their school. Their teachers listen. And... Uh, and the teaching is, is good. We've got to anchor ourselves and our children in a community that supports healthy lifestyles, in a community where adults are active in the lives of young people. Um, and I was very blessed to grow up in a village where I had not only um, my two parents, but a, a circle around us that, that were very active in my life, and I had role models 
um, and, and individuals that I could go to and talk to if I, for whatever reason, couldn't talk to my two parents. And I feel very strongly and very blessed that we need to have a village for our children. And we should not be trying to do it alone. Anchor number three is a belief system. First Peter 2, 9 says, you are chosen people, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. The number one purpose of our school system is to pass on spiritual values. Amen. The number one purpose. We want our children to be leaders. We want our children to be thinkers. We want our children to be mature Christians. We want our children to be Adventists. And as an Adventist educator, I believe in those three pillars, the home, the school, and the church. Um, we used to play uh, Monopoly in my house. Um, it was always work hard, play hard, and my parents were very intentional about family time. So during the winter, when we couldn't get outside and do fun stuff, we would play board games. And after all the chores were done on Sunday morning, sometimes Sunday afternoon, we'd sit down and play a board game. And my sister would always pick Monopoly because she could do it. And you know how to win Monopoly, right? You buy a boardwalk and park place and you put every hotel you can get on it and then you're done, right? Well, if you're a parent, you have a strong home, you have a strong school, you have a strong church and you engage in all three, that's the way you win the game. Amen. You gotta know how to win the game. So I wanna suggest to you um, that um, these three entities, this next graph is gonna show you when none of those um, entities exist, what happens to faith maturity? When one of those exists, when two of those exist, any two, just pick any two, or when three is there, faith maturity in your environment. And this next one is about denominational loyalty. I think this is interesting too. You're gonna more likely to be a long-term Adventist if all three of those pillars is in place. This again is value genesis data. All three of those things are in place. I want a mature faith, I want to be a mature Christian, and I want to be a lifetime Adventist. I want to be the one that's more likely to serve in my church as an elder or a deacon, more likely to be engaged in service, either in my local church, my local community, world missions, whatever. Um, I want to commit to the kingdom, denominational loyalty. Now, Value Genesis asked an important question. How much has this, and they listed 29 different things, helped you develop your religious faith? And there was 29 different lists. How much has this helped you develop your religious faith? In 2000, 74% said that attending an Adventist school very much, or at least somewhat, helped me become an Adventist and have a mature religious faith. Attending a school was important. In 2010, that had jumped to 82%, praise God, so we're improving. What's interesting to me is that mother's faith was number one. How much has your mother's faith? Now, how, I would answer that. My mother's faith had a huge deal to my religious faith development. My father's faith, my grandparents' faith, all of those are on the list. All of those um, different 29 factors of why I am an Adventist today, and I could say, yes, yes, yes. So mother's faith was number one in 1990 and in 2000. Unfortunately, mom dropped to third place in 2010, and we don't know why, but I could guess. I'm going to think mom went back to work, um, and that, um, that's unfortunate um, because moms are, are critical um, to faith development, I think. I remember, just as a little side note, I have to tell you that mornings when I would be ready to go to school and run in and say, okay, does this shirt match? Is this the belt? Do I wear these shoes or whatever? And inevitably, every morning, I would find my mother beside her bed kneeling in prayer. Every morning. She did not leave the house in the morning without kneeling beside her bed and praying for her family. And, uh, and praying for her church and praying for uh, the people my mother is, is um, quite amazing. I'm very blessed with her. But I will tell you, 29 factors, here's the top 11. I'm gonna tell you something about the top 11. Your Adventist school shows up in the top 11 five times. Amen? Your Adventist school shows up in the top 11 five times. 
my school, my week of prayer, my student week of prayer, my Bible teacher, my Bible class. 29 factors and education is in five of the top 11. We have got to anchor ourselves and our children in a belief system that withstands time. Roots that can handle the wings that we also want them to be able to wear. We have to have a belief system. Anchor number four is service. Anchor number four for me is service. Jesus could have used any number of texts from the Old Testament as his inaugural message as he introduces himself into the ministry. There are tons of texts from the Old Testament that he knew by heart that he could have said as he enters the ministry, but he chose this one. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In 1909, an 81-year-old religious reformer, prophet, and lover of Jesus Christ made her final appearance at the general conference session, and she spoke 11 times during that conference. Each one of them was on mission. In her keynote address on Sabbath, May 15, she said this, what the world wants now is men and women who have the missionary spirit, who understand why Christ gave his life, why he laid off his royal robe and his kingly crown, and he came to the world as a little child to be brought up in poverty. We need to pray now, she continued, to pray in faith. We need to carry forward the work that God has given us to do. Our children are to be saved, Our neighbors are to be labored for, and we are to act as if eternal life meant something to us. She talked a lot about the South, by the way, during that general conference. If you look it up, it's pretty interesting. Value Genesis 3, which is, again, that third study from that same major um, piece, reports that 73% of all students enjoy or very much enjoy helping other people in need. Service is important to our teenagers. They love that. They love that. As witnessed at Madison Academy, we must anchor ourselves and our children in the responsibility to be compassionate humanitarians. It's vital. Service is why we're here. And anchor number five, you've got to be thinking, surely it's coming. The word Do you memorize this one from Psalm 19 or maybe you sang it? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then I think if you jump down to, like I said, verse 14, where the chorus comes in. Do you remember this song? More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. You remember that verse? Ah, it's good stuff. Mrs. White in Steps to Christ said, there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties as the broad ennobling truths of the Bible. And the words of inspiration pondered in the heart will be streams flowing from the fountain of life. As third graders, we memorize Psalm 46. Maybe you remember that one too. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Do you remember that? 
And I'm not sure who selected that psalm or any other of the verses or the chapters of the Bible that we memorized during our schooling. We memorized a lot, but I do know why it was selected. It was selected so that when 38th graders who experienced tragic loss like we did, they would know that God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her, and that right early. It was chosen so that as an adult, when national tragedies like 9-11 occur, and I have got to figure out how to help my students process that, when hurricane winds ravage entire countries, when earthquakes lay waste to vast areas, I will remember, as an adult, helping my teenagers remember, the, the heathens raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. It was chosen so that I too would help my children know he makes wars to cease until the end of the earth. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Gotta anchor ourselves and our children in scripture. There are verses to commit to memory to install for instant recall, those memory verses. In fact, I saw one of your Sabbath school teachers in the hallway moments ago when we were out here um, complimenting three little ones on memorizing their memory verse for today. There are songs to be sung and yet to be written from these inspired words. There are prayers of praise, there are prayers of struggle, of joy, of sorrow, of comfort, of courage, more than you could possibly imagine in scripture. There are parables that provide instruction. There are stories of men and women whose choices led them close to or far away from God. And there's more than we could possibly learn just from what's between those pages. It's loaded. As a rookie principal, I wanted to engage the 14 churches, um, and specifically those pastors starting out, in my school. So I held a prayer breakfast, not really knowing what to do and certainly wanting to meet all of these gentlemen. And this was several years ago in California. And uh, I invited um, all these pastors to come and have a prayer breakfast, and we're gonna talk about our school a little bit. And for the program, I invited a pastor, a student, a teacher, um, a um, parent to share three minutes on why Adventist education was a good thing and why that particular school. And I will remember um, several times, it just comes to me, I remember the mom who shared that day and this was some 13 years ago now. And uh, Mrs. Jones stood there, not first of all, not wanting to, to present to this group of pastors and being a little um, worried about doing this. She had three children in my K-12 school, and she stood there with tears in her eyes holding a handwriting assignment, like a second grade handwriting assignment, and she's tears in her eyes, and she says, this is why I chose Adventist school. I don't know if you know that, but the handwriting assignments are scripture. It's pretty cool about being an Adventist system that's that large. Our handwriting assignments are all written by us, the Adventist system, and they're scripture. So as the children are learning to make their cursive or their print, they are learning scripture. And she stands here and says, this is why. Because I want the word of God written on the hearts of my girls. There is nothing more important to me, she said, than my girls. And to, to get to the kingdom and not have those three girls know Jesus, what, what is that? Where is that value? The Bible is meant to be unpacked, devoured, consumed, wrestled with, memorized. Will there be a time in history when we don't have it and we would need to have it? We've got to anchor our children. Amen. Have to anchor our children in an education, a degree, a skill, a plan. We have to anchor our children in a community a social structure in a world of secularism and uncertainty. We have to anchor our children in a belief system that is based in Jesus Christ alone. We have to anchor our children in a responsibility and a compassion for other people. And we have to anchor our children in the knowledge of the word of God. When life storms hit, 
depression, rejection, illness, loss, tragedy, economic disaster, you name it. Our children have got to have an anchor. Ray Boltz, who's a popular Christian songwriter in the 1980s, he penned these words, I have journeyed through the long dark night out on the open sea. By faith alone, sight unknown, and yet his eyes were watching me. The anchor holds, though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees as I faced the raging seas, but the anchor holds in spite of the storm. And when our kids meet life storms with their battered ships and their ripped sails, will they have an anchor? Will they be attached to the word of God? Will they be fastened to a faith structure in a community that can support them? Will they be anchored in Jesus? And I pray that that answer is yes, and that every day I pray for the courage and the strength and the wisdom to provide that structure. And I ask that you would join me in that. Pray for our children. And all the people said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Chris, for that powerful message you shared with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living so close to the edge of eternity. This is not just Christian education for itself. It is preparing your children, your family, for the soon coming of Jesus. More than ever before, this is the time you, what, you can do something to help prepare your boy, sons and daughters for, for God. Are you interested? You have to stretch your faith and trust in God. You have to reach out and say, Lord, I want to do what I can do for my part here. For my part, you need to talk to Mrs. Puentes afterwards. Talk, talk to me. We'll work something out. We want your family to have the opportunity to be able to respond and say, Lord God, please do what you can so we can not only notice what she said, the home, the church, and what? The school are major areas that can help our sons and daughters prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure if the AV team uh, got the message I sent. The Holy Spirit was impressing. We need to close with a song in times like this hymn 593. Thank you, they're great. Let's all stand together. And, in, and sing that song to the Lord. would like to have your anchor secured in Jesus Christ. Raise your hands. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us to worship you. Thank you for reminding us where our anchor is. It's in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be poured out upon each one here to be reminded each day, each moment 
We need to stay connected to Jesus. We need to do our part to make sure our family is secured and anchored in Jesus Christ. As we leave this place of worship, please pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit in a way that we will be reminded, do what we can now to prepare for your soon coming. And help us, dear Father, to be instruments of hope, to serve, to share the good news of the love of Jesus. Thank you in your precious holy name. Amen.